Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, bringing us together virtually um, in order to spend some time uh, looking at your word and thinking about um, what you're telling us there. We pray that you would guide us in our thoughts and in our conversation, that you'd bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so um, the recording for last week, we may be, it looks like we're going to be able to recover it. Uh, there were some technical issues. Um, we, for reasons which none of us really understand, it only recorded video, not audio. But Anton recorded the audio, so we'll try to get those things put together. But since most of you weren't here last week, I think it would be worthwhile to at least give a quick run through of uh, what we talked about. So that's what we'll start with, and then we'll we'll sink into the chapter. So uh, to begin with, um, there, there are sort of basic questions that we ask of any book of the Bible. Who wrote it? When was it written? Who was it written to? What was the destination? Um, and in all of these cases, the answer is we have no idea. Um, we don't know who the author is. We don't know what the occasion was, although we can infer some things from the text. We don't know who exactly it was sent to. Probably. Jewish Christians experiencing pressure to revert to Judaism or to sync, uh, do a syncretistic thing with Judaism, but that's there are, there are scholars who debate that point, um, and we don't know where they were. Um, in terms of authorship, this is one of these things that's hotly discussed. Um, suggestions range from Luke, uh, Apollos, uh, Priscilla, uh, I've occasionally seen people argue Nicodemus. The earliest attribution of authorship was actually Paul, uh, but that's almost certainly not the case. Uh, the reason why it isn't Paul is that it doesn't follow the structure of Paul's letters. He always follows a particular pattern, the standard pattern for letters in the Greco-Roman world. This does not follow that. Um, it's also the Greek is really very sophisticated. It's actually the second most sophisticated Greek in the New Testament, the most sophisticated being Luke. Um, that's why some people think Luke wrote it, but the problem is there are certain grammatical constructions that Luke really loves that don't appear much in Hebrews. So stylistically, it doesn't really match the way Luke writes. So it's probably not Luke. Um, if I were forced to take a guess, I would say that the probable author is Apollos, who we know is a very well-educated Greek who also knew the Old Testament inside out. He was a Hellenistic Jew. If I were going to be pushed for a destination, uh, I would guess Colossae. And there are a number of scholars who have suggested this. There's no real evidence for it. But in view of the fact that a lot of the issues that Hebrews addresses, Paul also addresses in his letter to the Colossians, it seems that the author to the Hebrews is writing to address similar kinds of problems. Um, there has been a suggestion that this was just something that Apollos, again, if it is Colossae, it's almost certainly Apollos, that uh, he wrote up to send to, to Colossae uh, prior to Paul's letter arriving. Um, it doesn't take the form of a letter. It's more of a treatise or perhaps a sermon. So that's about the best I can do. Virtually everything I just told you has been disputed. So, yeah, you want my guess, that's what it would be, but I'm not holding on to that very tightly. Now, um, in terms of the structure of the book, which is what I didn't talk about last week, it divides up into multiple sections. Um, each section is starts with a discussion of the superiority of Christ to something or someone. So it starts off with the superiority of Christ to the angels, then it moves to Moses, then it moves to Aaron, and so on. Every one of these sections starts with a, um, you know, an, an explanation of why Christ is superior and finishes with an exhortation. 
because of this, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't lose your faith in Christ. Don't leave Christ behind. He's better than anything else out there. He's better than all the alternatives. You know, so if I were to, if I were to summarize the themes in, in Hebrews, I would say one of them is the superiority of Christ over everything. And the second one is how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which is a quote from the book. Uh, those, it seems to me, are the, the twin themes that the book revolves around, the superiority of Christ, and then as a consequence that we, we need to hold fast to our salvation. Okay, so that's that's the overall structure of the book, and we'll be as we work through, you'll be seeing that. Now, I will add one other thing that we spent a fair amount of time on next week or last week, excuse me, um, and that is the way the author to the Hebrews uses scripture. And in general, what I can tell you is he doesn't read the Old Testament the way we do. Um, it's worth noting, and you know, my favorite example of this is that if Paul handed in the letter to the Galatians, which has this elaborate allegory of uh, say Sarah and Hagar and Mount Sinai and all of that, if he handed that in as an exegesis paper at a seminary, he'd be failed. Mm. And you know, the reason for that is we have developed an approach to scripture that is based exclusively on what's known as historical grammatical uh, or well historical grammatical is the usual term exegesis which means that we want to understand what the text meant in its to, in its original setting and that's what the text means you you shouldn't really go beyond that um, the problem is the New Testament authors regularly do go beyond it. And a rather extreme example is Paul there in Galatians. Um, Hebrews isn't as extreme, but we see the same sorts of things at work here. Uh, I would suggest, and actually if you read the early church fathers, they continue the approach to Old Testament exegesis that you see in Paul and in the author to Hebrews and frankly elsewhere in the New Testament. Um, I would suggest that they're operating on the basis of hermeneutic principles that were articulated by Jesus, hermeneutics, um, interpretation. Um, Jesus said two things about the scriptures, how to read the scriptures. One of them is, uh, you know, the obey, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So uh, whoever's dog that is, please mute yourself. Um, the, um, the point there is that when it comes to interpretation or application, if it is not leading you to, um, to love, you're doing it wrong. Okay. But the second thing that Jesus had to say, I'm going to have to mute everybody, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, the second thing that, um, if I can figure out how to do that, all right, well, things will quiet it down. Um, the second thing that Jesus has to say is, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, and these are the things that speak of me. And that is, in fact, the key idea that Paul and the author of Hebrews and the early church uh, used to interpret the Old Testament. They saw in the Old Testament, a uh, throughout it, it's all about a testimony about Jesus. Um, so you, one thing that evangelicals will sometimes uh, accept, although I've seen people arguing we shouldn't do this either, is typology. You know, the, the Passover lamb is a type of Christ, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that one tends to be acceptable. But when you're getting into the kinds of allegory that Paul does in Galatians, when you are looking at the way the author of Hebrews uses the text, um, by modern standards, it looks like they're playing fast and loose with it. But the problem is we're reading with modern eyes, not with ancient eyes. 
So um, that's uh, that's going to be something that we're going to be seeing pretty consistently uh, as we move through the book of Hebrews. He takes things that were about people in the ancient past and he applies them directly to us and to Jesus. So um, let's pause here. Uh, that's our summary of last week. Any questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself if you have one. I have a question, Glenn. Sure, Anton. Why do we obsess over who wrote a book when all scripture is inspired by God? Why does that matter? Uh, it, it matters largely because one of the criteria that was used to uh, determine which books went into the New Testament is apostolic authorship or someone who is very closely associated with an apostle. So Mark wasn't an apostle, but he was closely associated with Peter. Luke was closely associated with Paul. The author of Hebrews is unknown. We don't know if he had a real connection to any of the apostles. Now, having said that, the teaching in Hebrews is very consistent with what we see in Paul, which is one of the reasons why, for example, Athanasius in the uh, around the year 300 attributed the book to him. That was apparently commonly thought because the, the theology, the thinking in the book is very similar to his, but it's also got echoes of a lot of the other New Testament authors as well. But again, the question is, if we don't know who wrote it, how do we know this person is writing with apostolic authority? Uh, I think the conclusion to Hebrew uh, on this book was because the doctrine fit so well with the teaching of the apostles that they accepted it as authoritative. It really, you know, it, it fit hands in glove with the other teaching in scripture and it was accepted broadly in the church. And so for a variety of reasons like that, they accepted it um, even without uh, knowing the author. But author, and I think that's probably why the early church attributed it to Paul. They wanted to explain why it belonged in the canon. Um, again, it has to do with that issue of canonicity. That's that's really the key point. I have a question too. Sure. Last week you talked a lot about um, interpreting the scripture so that Jesus is in all of scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, and I don't remember you talking a lot about that other princ hermeneutic principle of um, interpret it, either the, all the law and prophets say, love your neighbor as yourself, and love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and I'm trying to think of any, like, of any example of what that would be. Okay, well... Or what that would look like. Uh, yeah, I, mean, like, I can think of is uh, current cultural, you know, love everyone, love everyone. That's what this whole thing is about, is love everyone. Right. So the question becomes, what what does real love look like? Um, Paul talks, for example, about speaking the truth in love. Okay, which means that we have to treat people with love, but we also have to treat them with truth. And How would that function as a hermeneutic principle of... Well, all right. So, okay. so uh, in where, the Old Testament. yeah, where this goes in the Old Testament is that when you look at the Old Testament laws, a lot of them don't necessarily seem to make a lot of sense. They they seem rather arbitrary or something like that. Um, the reason for this is the ceremonial aspects of the law are all pointing toward Christ, but the the civil laws, which are they're not laws the way we think of as uh, as laws. I you. They they are laws that are, uh, you know, for instance, do this building the edge to the roof or something. Right. Yeah. And they're, what they're you. doing what they're doing is they're laying out principles of what it looks like to love your neighbor. Yes. So the entire moral law is embodied in the civil law as well as the moral law of the Old Testament. You know, the moral law of loving God, loving your neighbor underpins everything. Yes, yes. So. And the Hebrew was more instruction. I mean, it was. Yeah, the word Torah in Hebrew, we use the word law, but the word Torah actually points to instruction more than legislation. You know, I'm giving you directions on how to live. 
I wish they were easier. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyone else? Okay, hearing none, let's go into the text. Now, the first three verses of the chapter lay out in a lot of ways the core theme of the entire book, the essential doctrine that, that the, the author is trying to drive home is covered in the first three verses, really the first four verses, but the fourth verse is also sort of a transition into the first section. So let's look at those verses, uh, starting um, chapter one, one to four. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Okay, so um, again, we, we covered a lot of this last week, so I'll go kind of quickly through it. Um, what the, the author begins by simply stating, you know, God has spoken. Uh, this is sort of a uh, a different idea in some ways in the Greco-Roman world, but the Jewish world was very familiar with the idea of God giving direct divine revelation. Um, he spoke at different times and in a lot of different ways um, through the prophets. Uh, the word prophet here, uh, the, the sense of it is not someone who foretells the future, it's someone who proclaims. A prophet is a spokesperson. So God had his various spokespeople, um, and, uh, he spoke at different times. He spoke in different ways through them. The very fact of this diversity points to the fact that the revelation in the prophets given, well, given the diversity of times and places and ways and all of that, um, wasn't complete. There was not a complete and total revelation of God. It was, it was sort of piecemeal in all these different ways. However, he says, in these last days, or at the end of days, it can be translated either way, um, God has spoken to us by his son. Now, I would suggest that the reference to son here has got multiple levels of, of uh, meaning. Um, one of them, of course, is the one we say in the creed that Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Uh, but this also goes back to Psalm 2, verse 7. Uh, psalm 2 is a psalm that was written about the Davidic king, uh, probably about David himself. And verse 7 says, I will tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. Okay, that verse is based on... Um, where God appears to David and promises to build a house from him for him and to have a, a, his descendant rule forever. Okay. Uh, we see that in Psalm 89 too. Uh, Psalm 89 also, excuse me. Um, Second Samuel, I think it's seven. Um, so, and so this idea of the sun here is pointing to the idea that there is going to be someone who is, well, God's son, like I said, literally begotten son, but also the son that God had promised David who would rule over all the nations. Okay, the Messiah. Okay, so it also points to, you know, the idea of going from the prophets to the son also points to the parable that Jesus told of the uh, uh, the the vineyard, where the owner of the vineyard rents out the vineyard to some people, but when it comes time to, for the harvest, they don't give him any. So he sends a whole bunch of messengers, some of whom they beat, some of whom they drive out, some of whom they kill. Um, that's the prophets, okay? In Jesus's parable, that's who those stand for. And then he says. Well, 
I send my son, maybe they'll respect him. And the owners of the vineyard say, this is the son and heir, let's kill him and get the vineyard for ourselves. So he is, the author here is also, I think, echoing one of Jesus's parables, just from the way this is opening up. Um, this should bring those that parable to mind. Now, the son is someone he that God has appointed to be the heir of all things. Um, Jesus is the one who will, well, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and who will rule over all things, the nations as well as the entire cosmos. Um, he will be an heir in that sense. God is designating him to be the ruler. But the interesting thing is he's not only the heir of the universe, he's also the creator of it. So you see, um, he is uh, the son uh, uh, who has been appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So the son is the one through whom creation happens. And here uh, we can go right to John 1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So he's picking up on a theme we see in John as well, that, that the Son is the one through whom creation happens. So he is simultaneously the creator and the heir of creation. From there, we move on to, he is the radiance of the glory of God. Um, the idea here, the, the, the glory of God, the, the word that mm. is used in Hebrew for glory uh, is kabod. And it's something that, that indicates weightiness, substance, um, heaviness. Um, so the presence of God, uh, where God's glory is, is a place where his weight is felt, as it were. But when God's glory appears, when, for example, God's glory uh, enters the temple, when Solomon dedicates it, it's accompanied by radiance. It's accompanied by the Shekinah, the shining light of the glory of God, that in a lot of, in the Hebrew mind, is really inseparable from the glory of God. You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, now, because we know different things about astronomy, um, this is less uh, less effective in analogy, but it's sort of like the difference between the sun and the light of the sun. You know, for someone who lives on earth, you can't conceive of the sun apart from its light. Um, you know, so yeah, now we know all about plasma and stuff like that, so we can draw the distinction because of physics. But if you're thinking about this just in terms of the average you know, non-scientifically minded individual on the ground, when they think of the sun, what they think of is the brightness and the light and the, well, the glory shining out from it, the radiance of its glory. That's the kind of thing that's being said about Christ here. Um, and then he moves on, and the exact imprint of his nature. Uh, the imagery here is, is drawn most likely from signet rings which were used to authenticate documents, sort of like a, a royal seal or something like that. When you impress the signet ring in wax, um, which is the way the Romans would do it with the ring, um, it creates an exact duplicate of what is on the ring. And that's in fact how you authenticate that the thing is, is genuinely from the person it says it's from. Um, there are scroll seals and things like that that do the same kind of thing. Um, the idea here is that when you, you know, it's what Jesus uh, tells Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The only way we have to really know God and to see God and to comprehend him as he is, is to look at the person of Christ. He is the exact imprint of who God is though in human form. So everything that, in a lot of ways, everything that we can know about God is contained in Jesus. Okay, 
so from there, he adds one other thing. Not only did he create the universe, but he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So the universe is not self-existent. You know, it's not like God created the universe and then just sort of sent it off spinning into the void to operate on its own, to, to continue to, uh, to exist apart from him. Um, the deists back in the 18th century used to use the analogy of God as a clockmaker. You know, uh, he, God made the universe uh, like a, a, a clockmaker makes a clock. And then he basically took the universe and stuck it on his mantle and put a dome over it uh, so that uh, nothing happened to it. And he doesn't interfere with it. He doesn't do anything with it. It just ticks along on its own. Uh, this was the way the deists would, would use to get around. Uh, miracles can't happen. The incarnation can't happen. Any of these kinds of things while still trying to hold on to an idea of God. Uh, the problem is it's utterly wrong. The fact of the matter is, according to scripture, the universe only exists at this very moment because God is upholding it. The, our entire being, our entire existence, everything that exists only exists because God is sustaining it. Apart from God's sustaining effort, apart from God actively maintaining every quark in the universe, it disappears. Only this is done here we see it is done by the second person in the Trinity. It's done by the Son. The Son is the one who actually sustains and holds the entire universe together. Um, he is the one who created it. He is the one who sustains it. Now if you want something really mind-bending, Next time you see a manger scene, consider that that baby in the manger, the person that is there, is the one who is holding the entire universe together. You just can't get your head around it. Just I can't. It's no, no, no. Um, Not yeah, I mean, I, I, I think a lot about the incarnation. Um, around mm -hmm. this particular issue. I, I don't understand how Jesus can be fully human, the person of Jesus can be fully human, and yet at the same time upholding every atom, every quark, every electron, every mm -hmm. whatever else you've got in the weirdness in space. He's the one who's mm -hmm. holding it all together. And yet he's human. Now, he's also God, but well, so I, I don't even begin to pretend how those things work. And so saying that God is the creator and sustainer of this earth, no, it's God is the creator, Jesus is the, the sustainer. Well, except the universe was created through Jesus, through through the Son. Yeah. So, so he, okay. he is the, the means by which creation occurred, and he is also the means by which creation is sustained. Through, through his word of power, through his powerful word. And by the way, the use of the word word here is also important because it ties us back to John 1 and the idea of the Logos, which has got a lot of implications in Greek philosophy that I'm not going to go into here, but it is, in fact, those ideas are active right at this point. Because the Logos, well, the short version is the Logos is the principle through which in both Neoplatonism and Stoic philosophy, it's the principle through which the universe was created, and it's literally the logic, the sense of the universe. And so by speaking of, of his word of power, or the powerful word, we're, we're, we're tying into these, these Greek ideas of the Logos as the ordering principle of everything that exists. Okay. So that's what we're dealing with with the sun. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to point out that most of our songs uh, that we sing in uh, worship services in evangelical churches have none of this. Um, 
it, we, we tend to focus much more on Jesus as our friend, uh, uh, Jesus uh, as the one who loves us, you know, on our relationship with him and all of that. We sort of forget, I think, in a lot of our worship music, who it is exactly that we're really dealing with. Okay. And these verses are intended, well, like I said, the entire core theme of the book is the superiority of Christ over everything. And, and the author is just hitting you with this smack in the face right from the very beginning. This mm -hmm. is who you're dealing with. But then the interesting thing is the next thing, the climax of all of this. And this is another theme that we're going to be seeing throughout the book. After making purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So the climax of all of this is not even Jesus as the creator and the sustainer of everything that exists. The climax of it is our salvation. It's the fact that Jesus, the one who created the universe, the one against whom we have been in full out rebellion, he's the one who actually made purification for our sins. And this is, this is, you know, in terms of the, the, the direction of the book, this is the core, this is really a core element again. The idea that, that sins are forgiven through Jesus, that he is the one who offered an absolutely perfect sacrifice that actually covers all the sins of his people. Something that, the old priesthood could never accomplish. And again, we're going to be seeing this as we move through Hebrews. This is going to be a theme he's going to return to because he's, you know, he's got to, the, given the issues that, that the audience is facing. So making purification for sins, and then he adds the extra point after making purification for sins. So he purified the sins. Then he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, the significance of this is twofold. First of all, the one piece of furniture that didn't exist in the temple was a chair. And that's because the work of the priests was never done. There was always another sacrifice. There was always another sin to atone for. Well, Jesus has taken care of all that. He's completely fulfilled the ceremonial law. All of the things that those things couldn't do, that they, but they pointed toward, he's accomplished. His work is done. So he sits down. He's finished. Okay. Now, it's worth noting that the one time that you see Jesus standing after his ascension is at the stoning of Stephen, where Stephen says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Um, why is he standing there? Well, in the ancient world, you prayed standing up. So Jesus, now there are two possibilities here. I think that's the most likely of the two. Jesus is standing because he is actually making intercession for Stephen and even for Paul, who is right there involved in the stoning. And probably the others as well. The other possibility is he's standing to greet Stephen because he knows he's about to die. But generally... The scriptures talk about, you know, the, the overwhelming theme is Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the location of the seat is important here because um, in the ancient Near East, a king would seat his heir, well, actually, really throughout the ancient world, a king would set his heir at his right hand to indicate his heir is a co-ruler with him. The right hand is the, the seat of honor. It is the seat of power because it is toward the right, which is symbolically where power comes from. Apologies to you lefties. <laughs> um, but um, so the, the fact that he is seated after making purification for sins shows that his um, priestly work is done. The work of the priest is over. We don't need them anymore because Jesus has completely accomplished everything that they were about. And the fact that he's seated at the right hand indicates that he is ruling. Uh, he is co-ruling with God. Um, he is not just a priest, he's a king. 
a theme to which we will return later when we get into our discussion of Melchizedek. So, uh, the, this intro finishes up with the sentence having become, or the clause, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And then he's going to go into a long discussion here of why Jesus is, in fact, superior to the angels. But the very fact that he's seated at the right hand of God by itself demonstrates this. Um, and his, his position is way above theirs. In fact, it's, he says um, the name that he inherits is um, more excellent than theirs. Okay, name. Uh, in ancient thought generally, and especially in Hebrew, uh, names were supposed to reflect nature. In other words, your name was not just an uh, arbitrary designation. It said something about you, who you are, um, what you are, all of those kinds of things. Uh, this is why uh, frequently in the Old Testament, when someone has a life-changing encounter with God, God gives them a new name. Jacob to Isaac, for example, Abram to Abraham, uh, Sarai to Sarah, and so on. Jacob to Israel. I started with that one. Um, so we, ha we have that. So the name that Jesus inherits, what he, at, when he fulfills the new covenant, when the New Testament, the new covenant is put in place, um, and he becomes the heir of all things, at that point, um, he inherits a name that is, uh, well, as Paul says, the name that is above every name. Um, again, pointing to his exaltation. So what we see, now we'll, we'll continue on with, the, with the, the discussion of angels here. Uh, but what we see here is a really profound and powerful statement of who Jesus is. It's a powerful statement of Christology. Um, it, it's a powerful statement about the deity of Christ. And it integrates, again, it integrates very well with lots of other passages of scripture. There are allusions, I believe intentional allusions, to Jesus's, um, uh, Jesus's parables. Uh, there's language that is probably echoing John. There's certainly elements that are connected to Paul. Um, you know, if you, you look at uh, Colossians 1, you will see very similar things said about Jesus. Um, so that's the intro. Let's pause here. Questions? I've got a question you brought up very briefly in Melchizedek. And I always wondered if Melchizedek wasn't Jesus. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get. Thing. We'll talk about that okay. when we get to Melchizedek. But the answer is okay. no. No, no okay. there, are right. people, there are people who believe he's a Christophany. I think that uh -huh. that comes from a misreading of what's going on in Hebrews. But we'll talk about okay. that when we get to him later. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I think it's interesting that if if this book was written to to Jews or people who were the the whole thing that I mean every day the Jewish people would say, um, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." So it seems to me that the early church their main thing was to show who Jesus was, mm -hmm. and yeah, and and in fact, that is going to be the core um, core issue in a lot of ways uh, that the early church has to face. It's going to take them uh, over four hundred years before they actually hammer out a balanced understanding of who Jesus is. Um, and by and using the word balanced here, what that points to is that Scripture says a lot of different things about Jesus that are that are in tension with each other um so how do you maintain the truthfulness and the authority of all of scripture 
while resolving these kinds of tensions? Um, the answer really ends up being the Trinity and the mm -hmm. idea of Jesus as one person in two natures. It's the only way to make everything work. Mm -hmm. And you know, but it, but the it takes the beginning of all that argument. <laughs> right. But it takes centuries for the church to actually work out as much as they can on that, because fundamentally we are dealing with things that are mysteries. We're never going to understand them completely in this life. Right. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Sure, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, um, verse four, having become as much better than the angels. He became better than the angels? Wasn't he already better than them? Well, we'll deal with that one. But this, <laughs> okay. this is a reference to um, Psalm 8, uh, which the author to Hebrews applies to Jesus. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, but have crowned him with glory and honor. So, as a human on this earth, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. But with his ascension and his enthronement in heaven, that's all reversed. So, there, there is a period. The, the sun was always superior to the angels. Could you just say that one more time because the internet dropped out? Okay. Yeah, just that sentence that you said. Yeah, the, the uh, Psalm, Psalm 8, which we'll talk about. He, he gets to this later. Psalm 8 says, you know, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, but you have crowned him with glory and honor. Hebrews takes that and applies it to Jesus. So Jesus in his incarnation as a human is made lower than the angels. Sort of his station. His station. But with his ascension and enthronement in heaven, um, that changes, and he is once again above them. The sun, as the sun, he was always above them. But what we're dealing with here is the person of Jesus, of the who is fully God but fully human, and the human, the the human side of it, which is what Psalm eight is pointing toward, is a little lower than the angels. Does that make sense, Sharon? Oh, yes, it does. I, I've always wondered about that. And, uh, and where man came in, is it man? We die, or we, we, you may not want to go into this, but when man dies, are they higher than the angels? Well, according to scripture, we are going to judge the angels. Yeah. So, yes, there will come where a time. Is that? Where is that? I'm sorry. I don't remember the reference off the top okay. of, of my head. Um, the the sentence is do you it's in it's in Corinthians first Corinthians um, do you not know that you will judge the angels um, it's in the section on disputes among yourselves and you're going to law courts and stuff you know the angels are also created beings right and it's interesting to think about about what how much they understood and how much they didn't understand because Satan came and, and tried to tempt Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he must have thought at that point that he could have done it. Yeah, that he could have pulled that one off. Yeah. Which meant he didn't really understand everything. Yeah, yes and no. Um, it's hard to talk about Jesus being tempted if it was absolutely impossible for him to fall well i know well yeah so, you know because you, but but i'm saying yeah. that yeah that 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 satan yeah satan didn't, satan understand. didn't get it he thought and, that and, he could win and paul talks about that in ephesians uh -huh. um i think it's in ephesians if they you know uh if the powers uh, had understood what they were doing they would never have crucified the lord of glory yeah um but they didn't understand where this was going right. so yeah. Um, the thing to remember, by the way, is that, as we'll see here, uh, angels are created beings. They are not, they are, we, apart from the incarnation, we have more in common with angels than we do with God. Apart from oh. the incarnation. Huh. So when you read 
when you read uh, Ezekiel, all things weird and wonderful, <laughs> um, and, and you read the description of the cherubim uh, carrying the throne of God, or the four living creatures in Revelation or whatever, we have more in common with them than with God, apart from the incarnation. The reason is that there are two kinds of beings that exist. There's God and there's everything else. And the everything else includes all the angels and so on. God is transcendent. He's above and beyond all of this. Mm -hmm. He is not part of the created order. He is not part of the invisible world of angels and demons. He is he is not the top of the pyramid. He's not the top of the food chain here, not the top of the pyramid. He's completely separate. Everything in creation has more in common with each other than they have it with God, apart from the incarnation. That's why I have to keep adding that, because the, the fact that Jesus became human, that the Son of God became human, means that there is something that we have in common with God that nothing else in creation does. Yeah. Good. Okay, I like that. Can you take one more? You sure? I know this isn't an angel lesson, but uh, <laughs> as we talk about creation and the fact that God created man in his own image, yeah. right? is there anything that tells us that angels were also created in his image? Oh, they were not. That's, That's what, what I'm saying. saying. So I think there's a distinction, right? Yeah, there is a distinction there. But you have to understand yeah. what image of God means in the Old Testament, uh, okay. in the ancient Near East. Uh, the idea of being an image of a God meant that you were claiming that that God gave you authority to rule. Okay. And we see this actually echoed in the language of Genesis. Let us make man in our image and let him have dominion. That it's repeating, you know, it, it's a repetition of the concept in different words. So human beings were put in charge as stewards of the creation, intended to take what God began and to finish it. Okay. None of the angels had that job. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, so now with, with this transition in verse 4, uh, we move into the first major section. And this is where we're going to see some of the, um, some of the rather odd exegesis by modern standards uh, that I talked about in the beginning. Uh, and we're going to go through all of these these um, these references. Um, I won't necessarily go directly to them, but I'll give you context and explain what they're about. So let's just start off. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? That's Psalm 2, verse 7. I talked about that. Again, Psalm 2 is a royal psalm. It is a psalm uh, of David. Um, pointing to the Davidic king as the one through whom uh, God will eventually judge and rule the earth. Um, it was probably spoken originally about David himself, but in a prophetic and typological way, the Davidic king, especially throughout the book of Psalms, the Davidic king always points toward the Messiah, the one who is David's greater son. By the way, when you're reading the Psalms, pay attention to the superscription where it says of David or something like that. Um, it's giving you a hint that this is going to be a Psalm, well, either written by David or about David. It could be either way. And if it's about David, it's also about the Messiah. The other thing you need to pay attention to in the Psalms is the singulars and plurals. They make a big difference. Um, so in any event, that, that, that's a whole different set of lessons. So right here we see the reference to the Davidic king as being God's son, as being designated as God's son. Um, 
his, well, his only begotten, as we would say. Um, then you have, uh, or again, also in the context of speaking to David, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Um, that is a reference to 2 Samuel 7 again, um, where God is promising to David a line that will, um, that will, well, rule forever, that David will have someone on the throne forever. Um, and God says about him, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. So the point he's making here is that Jesus, as the descendant of David, as the heir of David, as David's greater son, is not just David's son, you know, biologically. That's not the only thing that's important here. What's more important is God himself is declaring Jesus to be his son. You know, we can think of Jesus' baptism where the heavens open, the spirit descends on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, or on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my son, listen to him, as Peter is babbling. Okay, so we're, we're seeing the, the son theme connected to the Davidic king here, which is fulfilled in Jesus, David's heir. So those two point directly to this Davidic component of it. And, and notice, though, what, they're, what he is doing here. Um, if you take these in the original context, there's no indication that David's heir is literally going to be God's son. Saying... I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me um, is different from saying that Jesus is in, in fact actually begotten of God. If these things were said of David himself, which they were, um, uh, particularly the first one, um, it doesn't, it, the, the historical context, if you read commentaries on Psalms, what they will tell you, especially Jewish commentaries on Psalms, is that this is simply designating the Davidic king as God's special agent in the world. And yet the author to Hebrews says, e, no, not so fast. It's not, it's a lot more than that. It is actually speaking literally of who the Davidic king is. It is literally the son of God. So here's a case where most scholars say that the text itself is metaphorical, but the author to Hebrews says, well, no. Um, its fulfillment is in Jesus, and its fulfillment here is literal, not metaphorical. <coughs> so, um, and again, he says, again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. I'm actually not going to do this one. Um, and we'll hold this one off for next week. Uh, because it is nearly 8 o'clock, and this one is tough. Because if you actually try to look up this verse in the Bible, you won't find it. So what is the author doing? Stay tuned for next week. Because, like I said, I, I, I don't have time to actually work through that one here. It's, it's a, a tad more complicated. You'll find uh, in a lot of your Bibles will have footnotes to text, and when you read the text, they don't exactly look like that. So we'll have to talk about what the author is doing here. So uh, we will leave it at that for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Oh, and by the way, as usual, uh, once we end, I want to really try to honor the hour seven to eight. Uh, once we're done at eight, I will hang around to talk, chat, uh, answer other questions, that kind of thing. Okay, so with that, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and as we look at what this tells us about the Son, about, about Jesus, who is the, the author of the world, uh, the sustainer of the world, uh, the one who made purification for our sins, the one who's the radiance of your glory, the exact imprint of your being, 
the heir of all things. When we look at this, we're frankly in awe of who he is, who you are, who you sent into the world on our behalf. Um, it's, it's breathtaking and it is mind boggling and we can't even begin to comprehend uh, all that this means, but such as we can, we, we rejoice and we thank you. Uh, we glorify you for what you have done for us. Um, and uh, we worship and honor the Son uh, as creator, sustainer, and redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray.